wonderful. We're going to have a whole lot of information. I'm happy to send the uh, PowerPoint for this one to anybody who'd like it. Um, I am asking, though, that anybody who would like that uh, complete the survey so that we get your response so we can continue to improve our uh, sessions. So I'll put that up in the chat so that anybody, the survey link, um, if you want to copy that down to make sure you got it. And then this is a little bit of uh, information about the different people that have been involved in this uh, project. What we're going to talk about is applying to art fairs. And the first part about that is how do you decide which art fairs to apply to? Because if those of you who are out there searching probably realize there's 10 different things you can be doing every weekend. And the key is what makes a great fair for you might not be the right fair for me and vice versa. So these are some questions that we suggest you ask yourself. What are your goals? Who buys your art? And then the uh, things under number three there are basically all factors that are into consideration. You'll see in the photos on the bottom, there's four very different events there. And what works again for one, likely doesn't uh, work for the others. This is the range, in my opinion. You start with Art Basel, International Art Fair, um, it, booths are five to seven thousand dollars and up, and uh, you know most of the work is selling for five thousand and up. And then all the way down, you got the community festivals and then the questionable art fairs, and that's kind of represented in that final photo, which basically shows a stage with a crowd in a um, Ferris wheel. Uh, some of you might do really well in that environment, but it's not generally conducive to selling fine art. So reading a prospectus, there is no such thing as a unified prospectus that everybody does the same. Even on a site like Zapplication, which has hundreds of art fairs and people have to fill out the form, the information that they give is not uniform. It's not like where you can buy a package of popcorn and then buy potato chips and compare the two to see which one's the better choice for you. You have to do a little bit more research than that uh, using the art fairs. These are all some of the things that you might want to know about the art fairs. And again, don't feel like you need to take notes and such because anyone who completes the survey at the end, I'm gonna make sure that you get a copy of this. One of the things I wanted to make sure too was that you understood that the expenses of being at an art fair include more than just the booth fee. I think most folks in, understand that, but these are some of the many things that uh, can, can end up costing. And even some art for, fair producers, I think, don't realize that the booth rent is often less than a third of the entire expense for participating especially for those who are coming for a distance. These resources, again, you don't need to copy them right now, but if you'd like to take a photo of it, that's fine. And I'll send it to you and the links are working. Um, the event listing sites are places where primarily they tell you about events that you could theoretically participate in. A lot of them also have some ranking systems and such. Uh, the Art Fair source book is a subscription-based one. It's an extremely great resource, I believe, for higher-end artwork. Uh, if you're selling work for $100, $200, I don't think you need to invest in their source book. But if you're selling expensive work, uh, it's going to be well worth it. I guess I just kind of look at a lot of Google pictures, a lot of Google images to see other artists there, what the what the vibe is like, or um, you know what the show's description is on their website, and just kind of a little bit of research on the show in general. When you're looking for a show to apply for, an art fair to apply for, you really just want to read the fine print, talking to people, and I go on the social media platforms that the show has to see if they have any pictures of what the show looks like during the event. Uh, they're using images more than anything else. 
to decide on the fairs, which I think is a really valuable tool. They look and see any art fairs put up photos uh, from the artists that are participating. So you can see who's there. Many of them have photos of the show. So the great thing is that uh, you can really experience the show to some extent before you even uh, get there. You can get into it very inexpensively by staying close to home, doing craft fairs and such, rather than learning everything at the most expensive art fairs, the most expensive projects out there, learn on an inexpensive way. And Larry, you're right. The best way is to uh, get out there and network with artists. And part of the reason for that is if you're working with artists, especially somebody in a different medium, they're likely to be uh, honest with you and they're likely to not have a reason to be anything but honest with you. Event pr producers like myself tend to believe in our own shows. So we may speak about them a little bit more enthusiastically than they deserve. So most of you likely have artist statements already. I've noticed over the years, more and more artists using the third person in their artist statement, which feels wrong to me when somebody says, Mark agrees that this is what happens. That just doesn't feel like it's an artist speaking. It feels like somebody's describing them. Yeah, I would think it should be a first person thing, you know, because it should be a message coming from the artist. They, it's really important how that statement is written. I think artists really need to understand how important that statement is. Yep, it's one of the, the tools that the jurors have to be able to determine who belongs in the show. Uh, I've got Shia Durbin's artist statement there. She agreed to let us use it. And here is a short video by artist Donna Jackson. And what is an artist statement? Uh, simply, it's a description of your work. Um, it's written in first person, and it, it is really about your current work. This is separate from your bio. Your bio is about you as an artist. The artist statement is about your art. Okay, photos. Now, Larry Berman, who's on this call, is an expert on this, and he uh, did a workshop for us, and we'll have a piece of his workshop in just a second. Um, art photos. One item in the photo, non-intrusive background. Make sure your format requirements match the format requirement of where you're sending it. For example, the sizing, if you'll see down there at the bottom. Your jury images are normally of work that has sold long before you get to the show you've applied to. And they need to be meticulously prepared. Backgrounds need to match. It needs to be a uniform body of work. When you walk into your booth, you see 10, 12 pieces that are all different. And some people have different framing. Some have different matting. It doesn't stop the piece from selling. But if you were to put those in front of a juror's, then you'd want everything to match. So you get to put a descriptive text for your photos in there. And I think one thing some people do, which is not to their benefit, is they'll use the same descriptive text for all of the photos instead of putting a different description under each. So when a juror looks at that and they see the same thing repeatedly, it's not as helpful for them to feel great about your work as when you uh, give them a little bit more detail and a little bit more information. The booth, the booth picture, um, it needs to have as few distractions as possible. These are three jewelry photos that I've received over the last little while. One of those was invited to the show. One of those was on the wait list and one of them was not invited. Right. Now, I'm not saying that the quality of jewelry is any different in any of these, but uh, this is the results of that one. Right. Yep. Right. They may be exactly the same quality jewelry. In fact, the rejected one could be even better jewelry for all we know. But as the jurors are deciding, they can only work with what they see. A uh, booth photo, for those of you who are new to this, is a shot of what your 
uh, display space is going to look like. And a big question that comes up a lot of times is, hey, I've never done a sh show. How do I do a booth photo? Well, a lot of people will buy their equipment and set up in their driveway or on the lawn and put together something to show what it'll look like. Others um, are unable to really do that. So I've had people send a table with work on it. The booth photo is absolutely required by the top shows. And if you don't have one, it's unlikely that they're going to consider you, even if you explain to the, you, them why you don't have it. Um, I guess I'm middle tier shows because if somebody is new to the show, I expect that they're not going to have a booth photo. So I just want something ideally that shows me they know how to display their work. So if they put out five pieces on a table and it looks like they understand how that's all going together, that's good. Uh, we're going to get a little deeper than into this, but one of the things about the booth photo is it's not necessarily going to be exactly the same as your booth at the show. For example, if I'm walking through a show and I see a booth of paintings, I'm looking at the paintings, it's really easy for me to separate those from the uh, landscape in the distance because of the way that our eyes work. But if I look at it in a photo and the landscapes in the distance, everything shows up on the same plane. So it looks very cluttered. So even if you're not going to use a back curtain or wall, uh, when you get to the show, you should have one for your photos. Regina, the, the, booth, the booth picture, um, it needs to have as few distractions as possible. And it's the same with the artwork. They need to just, they need to look at your work judge your work and then give you a score and move on to the next artist. There's always a time frame. So here's again, example of three booth photos. One of them was invited, <laughs> one was rejected, and one was waitlisted. And by the way, most of the people don't use the term rejected because they feel like it's a little offensive. I feel like I want to use it because I believe that when you don't get accepted, that's the way people feel. And when I pretend that that's not what's happening, then I don't have to be as sensitive about it. So that's the term that I prefer to use. Okay, and a good resource for jewelry displays are counters that travel well. If you see in the middle there, those glass counters I believe those are the kind that uh, fold down so that they can fit into a box. So. so you can get a very attractive booth using something like that. Um, over in the one to the right, you see they have some display panels. Another thing that's useful is uh, hanging mannequins, even if it's a flat mannequin, so that you can put it on the, uh, put it on to show what it looks like when it's worn. Many jewelers tell me that uh, they wear the jewelry that they most want to sell. And it works. People will buy it right off your body. And Stephanie, I see you uh, nodding there. So if you have pieces that you've been uh, holding on to a little too long, that might be a way, as long as you have the build for it. You know, some people have a build more for uh, larger jewelry, some people more delicate jewelry. Uh, so if you're a jeweler that works in something that wouldn't necessarily fit on you, then uh, I wouldn't go ahead suggest that. But for the most part, I think it works. And then Stephanie, uh, you suggested displays2go.com. Uh, that is a great one. Um, also, if you look at Art Fair Insiders, there's always people who are selling old displays and things and you may be able to pick up something inexpensively. These are four of the web-based application service, services. Uh, Zapplication is a nonprofit. Um, they charge shows between $1,000 and $2,500 to use it. And because of that expense, the booth, uh, the application fees on that tend to be a little bit more expensive. I think the average application fee now is a little uh, north of $25.
And that application fee just pays for somebody to look at your work. It doesn't necessarily um, do anything else. It doesn't get you a refund of that portion if you don't get into the show. And it doesn't always get you an explanation of why or why you didn't get into the show. Some of the shows are switching to using online during where you can actually sit in and uh, watch to see how the process goes and listen in. Others, uh, for example, my shows, we don't invite people to attend the jury because we feel that it's important for the jurors to be able to talk about the work openly. And so that, for example, if it's a jewelry piece, since we've been talking about jewelry some, and I'm unfamiliar with the particular technique, we should be able to ask the jewelers in the group that are familiar with that technique, uh, whether that looks like it was competently done, is that a difficult thing, et cetera. And it's easier to do that when we don't have the artist right there. But what I do is I do keep the notes from all of our discussions. And if somebody asks me for the notes, I'll send it to them. I used to just automatically send it and I got people really upset about doing that because when you receive your rejection letter is not the time you're most ready to listen and hear uh, for advice. So I wait until they say they're ready. Uh, juried art, fair art services, an associate of mine, Mary Strope is now the uh, manager of that, helps the artists and the um, events uh, use it. That one uses the really high end fairs and competitions. What's really cool is if you're like a plain air painter, you can find a lot of competitions on there that you could enter. And again, there'll be an application fee. So with a competition, you'd wanna be looking for what kind of prizes you could win to make sure that it's worth your while. All these links uh, work and I'll send it to you later on. Okay, so here's some reality about jury and, and tell me where I'm wrong here, or, or add to it. You're not gonna hear from most shows when they get your application. That's just not something that uh, they're gonna do. They're not gonna necessarily even uh, acknowledge it. Some of the larger shows, if there's something wrong with your application, it won't even get to the jurors. Why is that? Well, they'll tell you that it's because they're too busy, because they don't have time to go back. Another reason is that if I have 1,200 applications to go through for 100 spaces, and I can get 50 of them out of the way without any problem, maybe I'd do that. <laughs> I don't do that, but I think it's possible that that happens. Let's say your, your, your deadline for an application was today it's possible that you won't hear for two or three weeks whether you were in or not. Why? Well, sometimes it's uh, because they're doing a jury in by medium, i.e. all the jewelers, all the sculptors, all the painters, whatever. And it might seriously take them a week to 10 days to get everybody juried. Um, it could also be that there's other things that are delaying it. I wouldn't suggest calling if you've um, not heard from them. I think you're better off waiting for a little longer. And then as I was saying, some shows share the juror information, some let you watch and others, uh, you'll never know who was the jury. And every show has its own system. How many jurors, what the criteria is. Ideally, they put that criteria right out there in the uh, information so you can see what they're judging it on. And, you know, for example, I have one show that's called the Funky Ferndale Art Fair that has edgier artwork. I have other shows that are in uh, community parks and very uh, calm and sedate. We have much different qualifications and uh, some artists are actually in both and they have different booth shots and different artwork that they show. 
for those because they understand that different pieces are appropriate for different shows. And uh, Kim, uh, you're asking about if you've been turned down, should, is it bad form to ask? I would always ask. I've written some grants and when I've been able to get that feedback, I've been able to improve my grants so that the next year I can have a much better shot at them. Not every show is going to ask going to give you it, but I think it's definitely worth asking. And then I think there was some discussion a minute ago about whether a indoor shot for an outdoor show is acceptable. Again, there's gonna be some shows that are gonna use any excuse to downgrade you so that it's easier for them to get through the process or because there's so many applications, they're mostly going to take the people who were 100% right on. Uh, and that's something worth asking. When people call me before the deadline and say, hey, Mark, I don't have a booth shot, what can I do? I appreciate that, I can talk to them and I can work with them to make sure that we have the information we need. If I just get that application and there's no booth shot, it doesn't tell me whether they have a booth shot and they just didn't read the material or what's going on. So it's good to ask questions. Thanks for bringing that up, Kim. Okay, the results of jurying. You're gonna get an email with the results likely. If you're accepted, in the application, they call that invited. Then you have to go on and accept, and then there's a deadline to pay, or you can lose your spot. If you're having financial issues, which I think some of us are this year, go ahead and call, let people know that that's an issue. If you're not invited, there won't be any information generally other than, sorry, we had more applications than we could use or something really nice like that. But the general thing is like Kim was asking, yeah, ask for information if you want. And some people think the purgatory is the wait list because wait lists mean they'd like to have you if there's space, but there may be space or there may not be space. Now, why do I have a wait list? Because I know a certain amount of artists that are accepted are gonna be unable to uh, make it at some point. Uh, there's a lot of people that'll apply to two or three shows at one time because they need to have a show that particular week. And if they're accepted by multiple shows, they're gonna have to turn down at least one of them. What I try and do with my wait list is I try to have one or two artists at most on the wait list for each category. And I'm constantly asked, well, how do I know if I'm next on the list? Well, I don't know either. And why is that? Because if a painter drops out, I'm going to put in another painter to keep the show balanced. If a ceramicist drops out, I'm gonna put in a ceramicist. If you're a... Um, fiber artist and all the fiber artists are in, it's unlikely I'm gonna be able to continue to include you. And when would you be notified? Often the same day I send out responses, I get a response from uh, somebody who says, hey, you know, thank you, but I'm just not gonna be able to do it. And I can clear somebody from the wait list even before they knew they were on the wait list sometimes. Other times I'll get a call a day before the show. Hey, my car broke down. I'm not gonna be able to be there. And we'll try and give you a call. And if you're still available, maybe you could uh, do it, but maybe it doesn't make any sense for you at that last minute. And Amy Ferguson, who gave us some other comments earlier, everyone gets turned down sometimes. I think that's an important thing to keep, your, keep in mind. I put in there that that we really really love to talk to artists about their images. We never talk about the artwork, but the image, the the presentation, and it's so great when they call ahead of time, particularly a newer artist that wants input on their images, because then we have time to talk to them for 15 minutes, half an hour, and provide that feedback. If you call the day before the deadline, it's really hard to do, um, and but we'll also talk to people afterwards. Um, we do that all the time. 
Great, thank you. And there are a lot of photographers that will help you with your shots for a fee and it's likely worthwhile. This is the summary of what we were talking about. First, know who your audience is, age, sex, culture, price point. My price points, they're a little bit higher. So I kind of look for fairs that are a little bit more fine arts. Really, it depends on the area as well. So with my paintings being really nature-based and nature-focused, I tend to do better in rural areas or areas where um, it's a little more progressive uh, neighborhood. You can make sure that the shows you're selecting are appropriate for that audience. Understand the expense because it's much more than just the booth fee. Gather certain materials before applying, your photos, your artist statement, things like that. If you get onto the uh, site and try and do your profile, the moment that it's due, you're never gonna be able to, go to do a good presentation. In fact, even if you're not ready to apply to shows, I would go to each of those and create a profile now because that will tell you a little bit more about uh, what you need to do to be ready. Understand the jury process, review this material, and then come back next Tuesday, because we'll be talking next Tuesday about what to do. Once you've been accepted, how do you get ready for that show, especially the first show? And I see a question here, a good resource for A, how do you know who your audience is? Let me open that one up to the group. Do people have uh, thoughts and comments about that? Uh, Mark, yes. on that one, um, I was going to say that um, artists can, um, you have email, most people have a, a, a good email list for their uh, customers, clients. Um, don't be afraid to do a survey. And you can also use your social media, social media, Instagram or Facebook to ask a survey question, you know, like presenting your a piece. Uh, see what people's opinions are, you know, I mean, now with the internet, I mean, we can, it, the, the sky's the limit on anything. So whatever question you have, just ask it. But I, I when they were saying about um, uh, who you could talk to, or, you know, some examples, that's a good way to start. Sure. Yep. And you want to find those places where your audience is going to be. Again, like I said, some of my shows are one uh, style, other shows are completely different style. I can't tell as a show producer who your audience is. I might think I can, but I'm likely to be wrong. It's something that you're gonna have to figure out for yourself. Yeah. One of the best ways of going forward in this business, I think, is to find somebody else preferably in another medium that does well at the same events or the same platforms that you do, because that's somebody who you can compare notes with and learn with without uh, feeling like you're competing. If I'm a painter, you're a sculptor and people who have large houses and big expense accounts buy both of our work, we should be comparing notes. Yeah, Anna, by body of work, they're looking for usually a style of work. So you might have a ring, a bracelet, and a necklace that all have a similar style. So that would make for a great body of work. All work looks like it's made front by the same person. Yes, that is a key. And every so often I'll get a sculpture, a painting, and a piece of jewelry from the same artist. Now that's not a body of work. And even if they are making them all, it's a little concerning. Yeah, Lisa, you're right. Um, it's so important to find mentors. And uh, I think that's where artfairinsider.com might be a good place to do that. This is something that I always talk to my, uh, the people who I'm working with about when they're, you know, I'll ask them to do something. They'll say, oh, oh, I've never done that before. I'm so nervous. They'll know I never did it before. And my response is great, tell them. If I call you up and say, hey, 
I need some help on this. This is new to me. Please, can you tell me a little bit about your expertise? Suddenly, instead of I having somebody who thinks I'm bothering them and wasting their time, I have somebody who might become a mentor. This is a preview of next week's sessions. Having like a checklist kind of, like making sure I have everything that I need, everything's in the car, like hooks, as, like even the smallest things, like like enough business cards and, and hooks and enough framed pieces and just having a very long checklist. Okay, and then this is some terminology. Um, all of this will be in the package I'll send you if you send, uh, if you complete the survey at is dot gd backslash art career uh yeah colleen um you're better off at least the first time you go to a show going in with one medium and then after you've met them uh talk about the others on the other hand if it looks like it all goes together your paintings your weavings and your sculpture all have a similar theme and feel like they enhance each other. You could try that. It's difficult. Another tr thing that people sometimes do is they'll apply in multiple mediums. For example, there's a number of jewelers who also do sculptural pieces, metal, for example. So they'll apply in both mediums and they may or may not be accepted in either medium. So if they're accepted in just the jewelry, then they would only be allowed to bring the jewelry. If they're accepted in both, then they would clarify with the show producer and say, hey, I'm accepted in both. I'd like to put them both in one booth. And then other people would maybe uh, you know, say, I was accepted in one, but not both. So I can't do it because I need to have both mediums to be able to be profitable. Yes. And yes, you end up having to spend two separate application fees uh, for the different mediums. It's um, not necessarily the case for everybody. It's fine to call up the shows and ask them how they would like best to receive the materials. But in general, especially the larger shows, your jewelry, your fiber, your sculpture, and your painting are gonna be juried by different people. So really you are getting two, three, four, uh, jury and sessions out of it. So that's why they prefer to have a complete package for each of those mediums. Okay, Kim, writing uh, uh, resources for writing artist statements. I'm going to let Vicki talk about that for a minute if, she, if she's able. Uh, Vicki, again, my wife runs Mint Artist Guild. Um, well, there's there's a whole lot of information out there um, writing artist statements, um, a lot of blog posts, a lot of other things. I think the most important thing I tell artists is when you write your artist statement, get a couple of people to review it and edit it for you. You're probably visual artists. You're not, most of you are maybe are not writers. So find someone who will help you improve what you've written. I think if I can comment about them, you know, I think there's there's a, a difference between writing the artist statement that's going to go with your jury, because like I think Larry just put up that it's 100 characters or 300, depending on depending on the show. Uh, the show gives the the uh, spec for that, um, and the artist statement that hangs in your booth. They're two very different things. Uh, the one that is in the booth talks can talk about your inspiration and lots of things, but the one that's I find most successful on the jury portion is you have very little time, very few words. Tell us how you did the work. Don't tell us that you're inspired by the flowers and the moon and the stars because the jurors don't, in my experience, they don't care. What they want to know is that, is that a palette knife or is that a brush? Is that, you know, what, what's the technique, particularly when you get into things like jewelry and fiber, mixed media, where it's not it's not abundantly clear uh, from the image. Sharon, thank you. Uh, Anna, if I'm getting ready for the jury and I'm not understanding the work, sometimes I'll go to the website to make sure I'm understanding it, particularly when an artist hasn't done a good job of telling me how they did that work. Why? 
because I want to make sure that the artist has the is the one doing the work. And when I go on the website, are there social media, I can find out a little bit more about them and their process so that I can feel better about advising the uh, jurors if they ask those questions. Uh, Daryl, it sounds to me like you're a multimedia or mixed media artist because you're using different types of substrates, uh, different types of painting. So I would go with that uh, concept. But again, call each show, ask them how they would like to see your application. Dan, that's a great question. Uh, does anyone know about uh, people that would be receptacle to mathematical art, digital prints on canvas? I think that's one of the types of questions that Art Fair Insiders would be great for because you can ask uh, people questions. I'd also suggest there's a lot of uh, Facebook sites that are for artists and some that are very specific, metal artists, uh, funky artists, uh, artists from a specific area. Uh, you can get a lot of advice and suggestions there. Do you have to have a website that indicates a good amount of sales or a site that tells more about the artist? Uh, Lisa, any more, if you can sell work on your site or if you can have links to a, another place where you're selling work, you might as well do it because even this next year, if everything's open across the country, there's still gonna be people not coming out and I'd like to see you selling work. So you wanna make that as easy for people as possible. And then Heather, uh, acrylic fluid art, it's just a matter of the show. And you'll sometimes be able to tell it from the uh, descriptions. Other times you'll have to call. And then part of it too is if something's getting really trendy, expect that a whole lot of people are gonna be applying that in that medium and it's gonna get really competitive. As many of you know, jewelry is by far the most competitive medium. Often a third of the, the applications we get in are from jewelers. So clearly your chance of being invited as a jeweler tend to be a little bit uh, more uh, restrictive because I can't have a show that's one third jewelry. That's not gonna do well for anybody. And it's the case, I think, that jewelers, in my experience, jewelers also have the best images of all the categories. They are the strongest images. And so uh, particularly that booth one, those ones you were showing earlier, um, really important, the quality of the image. The competition is really keen. Yep. And then the show circuit, that is a challenge. Um, is there anybody here? I know we've got some 20 show veterans here. Is there anybody here that could address that? There was a time where I used to do 40 shows a year. <laughs> And you try to line them up. Um, for some of the top shows like um, Old Town, Milwaukee, Cherry Creek, Des Moines, they've purposely lined them up so you could go from one city to the next. And then there's the concept of a filler show. And what that would be is I know I'm going to be in Florida for those two weeks and there's a week in between. While I might want to take that week off, there's a few shows that are smaller or unproven that I might just go ahead and apply to, thinking that if I make a few dollars, it's better than if I don't do anything. I'd be careful with those, but I think it makes sense to, uh, to realize that you're not, even if the best artist isn't gonna have the best show week after week, it doesn't always flow that way. Well, yeah, getting that filler show, um, sometimes, the smaller shows can generate more income than the larger shows because there's less competition. I think the other thing about that is, like you said, Mark, but being careful because I've seen artists uh, who take a filler show and I see them in a show that, in my opinion, they don't belong in. Yes. It's too low a show for them and it's damaging to their, it's damaging to their brand they would be, in my opinion, be better off to not be there. Um, I know they might want the income for the weekend, but sometimes it might be a better decision because I think it damages their brand. I know a lot of people who will do small shows close to home, sometimes because that's where they started out and they're familiar with those shows, sometimes because they have friends in those shows or they want to support the organization. 
there's so many different reasons to do a show and there's so many different reasons not to do a show. We try to encourage artists who are able to go to, if there's a show near them that has an open preview day, um, may or may not be the actual jury. We, we do projected juries, so we have an open preview day. Go watch that preview because it is amazing what artists learn by watching those images up on the screens. Um, this year we did an open preview day for our digital, but uh, we're gonna go back to projected. But um, some artists find out that they really look awesome and some artists find out maybe I just should go back and not apply and go do my images again. And, come back, you know, but it's really educational. Just the fact that they see all the competition is pretty good education too. It's important to me that if I'm gonna do this stuff, that it's a value to you. So I need to know that. And if there's things that I can do differently, I need to know that too. So thank you so much for in advance for doing those surveys.